so I originally went to college. We'll go back that far to study physics. And near the end of middle of my senior year, end of my junior year, somewhere in there, I realized, oh, my God, I hate physics <laughs> and I don't want to do it. But I have to finish this degree because I really don't want to, you know, change majors at the end of my college career and stick around as an undergrad for two or three extra years. I don't even know what I want to study otherwise. So I uh, finished my physics degree through a variety of decisions. I ended up in a master's of mathematics program. Well, actually, it's a master's of science in mathematics program. I did that in a couple of years, and then I left and got a PhD in math in 2010. From there, I left the academy almost immediately <laughs> due to um, the varieties and, and, and demands of life and uh I missed teaching right away. I didn't miss grading. I didn't miss having to deal with an increasing email demand from my students, which had gotten just untenable the last couple of years I was there. But mostly I missed the thing at first, and I got into um, a variety of I, – I got a job, and then I've to keep myself academically entertained, I got into a variety of different fields of, of study and just started studying them on my own. So that would be philosophy of science, philosophy of religion in particular. I get very interested in the questions and the, the debates that were going on about religion in the early 2010s. And then that switched into me really wanting to understand what was going on there. So I started to study the psychology of religion and moral psychology to try to understand why people form groups that behave the way religions behave. And that really occupied most of my time from maybe early 2013 until 2016, going into 17. And that included also the psychology of authoritarianism. So that would be kind of the stuff that I was, was interested in. And I was writing what I thought were contemporary essays, uh, sometimes in you know relatively decent publications like Time Magazine and Scientific American, sometimes just on a blog and some stuff in between, I contribute chapters to books, wrote a few of my own. And that's what I was doing up until Peter Boghossian and I decided it was time to try to hoax gender studies. So how did, how did you and Peter Boghossian connect in the first place? Okay, so we actually connected in the first place on Twitter, of all places. I think that's actually kind of common now, but we connected on Twitter. Uh, I had, there were two things going on at once. I had written an essay regarding something to do with Sam Harris. I was probably, I don't even remember what the essay was now, but I was defending Sam Harris or elaborating on some opinion he had or something like this. And Peter saw it and thought it was great. And he reached out to me and said that he liked my writing. He liked what I was doing. And he kind of had two requests. One was, do you want to consider writing together some in the future, maybe a potential future essay or two? And then also, would you mind reading the book, my book or his book at the time that he was just finishing, which was a manual for creating atheists and giving my opinion and maybe writing a review if I thought it was worth it and all of that. And I, I agreed to both. And I guess he liked the way I wrote the review or something. We ended up writing a number of articles together for a number of years. Um, lots of stuff together, actually. We worked together pretty seamlessly. Um, we have a overlapping set of talents and deficits that works out to where we become something better than both of ourselves when we work together. So it went pretty well for a number of years doing that. And so that that's how we originally connected. And then we got into the whole thing about um, grievance studies as kind of just an, a natural evolution of, of that work uh, after keeping an eye on real peer review, their Twitter feed, and keeping an eye on uh, uh, stuff that was coming out. What is real peer review? Oh, so, so there's a Twitter account. It's now called the New Real Peer Review. It used to just be Real Peer Review um, that goes through. It's a group of people, I think, that are mostly scientists. And they actually scour the literature for 
ridiculous papers that have passed peer review. Sometimes they're they're papers in journals. Sometimes they're academic an academic thesis. Sometimes it's a book. Usually it's something at paper length, and they read them, and they highlight excerpts from the papers and kind of make fun of the papers. Really, I was going to say that they had the commentary, but they really just kind of make fun of them. And it's really a shocking insight into how many papers and in certain uh, veins of literature and in certain journals in specific are just really something to be concerned about that are almost, as people say, beyond parody or they're examples of Poe's law where you can't tell the difference between reality and parody anymore. And so following that and then this kind of a thing about the this paper about feminist glaciology trying to you know change this, the science of glaciology to fit with feminism and it got a ton of attention and it got highlighted on real peer review and people were writing articles about it swearing it must be a hoax peter and i said well if they can't tell the difference why don't we try one and so that's how we ended up embarking on the project that's now come to be known as the Grievance Studies Affair. And how did, and you guys also hooked up with um, Helen Pluckrose? Yeah, so the so Peter and I originally set up and we wrote a really, really bad one that's really funny called The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct. And that ended up getting into a journal that I'm not allowed to say it's predatory. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's, it's a journal that... Um, seems to have severe deficits in its peer review standards and will publish papers for money, but I didn't call it predatory um, because of reasons. So there's it, it that muddied the water. It got into a journal that we aren't that wasn't sufficiently good for us to draw any conclusions from, although that created a bit of a debate about whether or not it did. That was in May of 2017. And so there were people arguing that, yeah, the fact that it is a perfect parody of what you see coming in in real papers says something. And then there were people saying, no, it's a terrible journal, so we can't conclude anything. And a couple of people, one being Alan Sokol, after whom uh, our project was also named, uh, the Sokol Squared is another name that it's sometimes given. Alan Sokol wrote a hoax on a postmodern cultural criticism journal in 1996. And we kind of followed in his footsteps. So Alan Sokol laid out some parameters and said that we had partial success, but mostly failure. And had we done other things, we would have had more success. And then a couple of people who are pretty severe critics of us wrote similar articles that indicated that had we done X, Y, Z and W, then we would have had something convincing. But that's not what we did. So over the summer of 2017, Peter and I decided that we would take those criticisms seriously and starting with X, Y, Z and W, we would set forth new rules and start another attempt at this. And we were going to do it big and we were going to do as many as we could. We originally planned to write papers for one year and write as many of them as we could, see through until they were all either accepted or finally defeated and then report on the results, whatever they were. And pretty early on, we realized we needed somebody to help us um, understand theory, to catch glaring errors that we were making, to help us understand what was going on. And so my other friend and collaborator, Helen Pluckrose, is actually really, really, really well versed in this. She's very, very smart. And so we turned to her and asked her if she would help us in that regard. So she became kind of at that point that was early September. So we'd only been added a few weeks of 2017. She started becoming kind of my theory tutor, like uh, gender theory, queer theory, critical race theory. She was like my tutor for that. She would read our papers and say, oh, here's where, you know, somebody will say this is wrong or this is this doesn't line up with the way they think or whatever. And she coached us like that and helped us write what were just brazen and idiotic hoaxes. And that continued until November, and when uh, Thanksgiving hit, we got we got a rejected paper that was rejected for all the right reasons. So, it was so. This was this kind of the first round that you guys did, or are you talking about the so, full? So yeah, 
the full It gets host. a little complicated. So the mm-hmm. conceptual penis was like this first foray into the thing Peter and I did. And then that ended. And then we decided to do the big project that uh, is now called the Grievance Studies Affair. The conceptual penis was technically not part of that. Um, that we separated into <laughs> three different phases of sophistication. And so what I've described so far was the first phase where we were writing actual hoax papers. And then we learned the hard way that that wasn't going to work. You can't hoax these people. What they're doing from the inside makes sense. And they know what they're talking about from the inside. And they they understand it. They know what it looks like. They know what the scholarship says. And they take it quite seriously. So in November, we turned to Helen again and said, Helen, we have to up our level. We need to, as we were using the phrase, situate this in their literature. You know their literature best of all of us. Time to upgrade. You know, she was no longer our tutor and consultant. She became, you know, a conspirator full on at that point. And so we started doing that. Our second phase papers would have been that kind where we would situate things in the literature, then write crazy stuff. The dog park paper is an example of this. And then do whatever it took to make it work. Later, probably February or March, we got sophisticated enough where we actually had learned what we were talking about. And it became very difficult to write those just asinine papers anymore. And we actually just started writing real papers within the discipline that made ludicrous and and, and absurd claims or used broken ethics. So we kind of had three phases of sophistication, outright hoaxing, which didn't work. This kind of like blended, we know what we're talking about, but we're being absurd. And then we can just do this now as three distinct phases. So it got a little complicated there. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.